Good morning again. We had a really an exciting start with this uh, very alive presentation. And uh, we want to continue now with the second session that will be about methods uh, of uncertainty analysis. I'm uh, Laura Martino from the EFSA agency, and I'm, I'm going to co-chair this session together with Chris. Morning, everybody. My name is uh, Chris Roth. Uh, I'm from the French uh, Health and Safety Agency, ANSES. So, now we start straight away with our invited speaker. So, it is my pleasure to invite uh, on the floor Zora Kovacic. She is a postdoc research fellow at the University of Berg uh, Bergen, Norway. And uh, her research uh, area is about uh, science policy interface uh, in, and uh, how it is influenced by uncertainty and complexity. So the floor is yours. Yes. Maybe I use this one. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. Um, okay. So I just wanted to mention I work at the Center for the Study of the Sciences and the Humanities, which is one of the centers that focuses uh, on post-normal science. And so I will be talking to you today from this perspective and um, telling you a little bit about the type of uncertainty analysis that is done uh, in post-normal science. So uh, why do we measure uncertainty? Uh, uncertainty is very much part of measurements. Uh, quantitative measurements are often preferred because they are thought to be more precise than qualitative assessments and thus leave less space to interpretation. But I want to make the point that precision does not necessarily reduce the uncertainty. So I will use the example of the metric system to show uh, that standard measurements produce or entail uncertainty. So before the adoption of the metric system, uh, the trade of grains and produce was much more localized, and the quantities exchanged were measured using baskets and pots. Uh, the term bushel refers to the use of a basket as a mean to measure quantities that were traded. The use of bushels did not guarantee that different producers traded in similar quantities, as bushels came in many different sizes. Uh, for, these reasons, uh, for this reason, many towns in Europe in, in the Middle Ages had an official bushel, uh, sometimes carved in stone and placed at the entrance of the town, uh, which was used to measure quantities of grains, fruits, and liquids also that were traded. But even with a single bushel, measurements could be meddled with. And for this reason, uh, uh, rules were created to establish, uh, for example, whether the bushel uh, should be filled until it was flat on top, or until it had a small heap, uh, whether the grains should be dry or wet, because some grains, they gained volume when they were dry, and other uh, grains, they gained volume when they were wet. So both Porter and Scott explained that standardized measurements were introduced by central governments in order to allow for trade between villages and to create bigger markets. Standardization required that all the different bushels, uh, pots, stone carvings, etc., were translated into an equivalent measure in kilograms uh, in the metric system or pounds uh, in the UK and the US. So standardization required a great effort as people were not familiar with these abstract concepts such as kilogram. A kilogram was not something that could be observed or related to experience, like a basket or a bushel are. A kilogram is not a description of reality, but an abstract convention. So these type of tables uh, were used to help with the conversions. In this great effort to switch uh, to standard measurements, the knowledge of how to fill a basket, of whether it was better to use dry or wet grains uh, to maximize the volume, of how each grain was different from the other, all this type of knowledge was lost. Standardization made it possible for someone to trade without knowing what was being traded. So the metric system uh, makes grain legible at a distance, but also implies an important loss of information. Therefore, standard measures also caused a loss of knowledge. They created uncertainty. This example uh, shows how quantification is the result of a convention about what to measure and how to measure it, but also how measurement entails loss of information, and therefore uncertainty. 
So rather than measuring uncertainty, it may be better to talk about assessing uncertainty, which can be thought of as acknowledging the knowledge that is lost through measurements. As in the case of grains, uncertainty goes much beyond the standard error in the measurement of weight, uh, and includes also knowledge about the seasonality of grains, the quality of yields in uh, current year, the nutritional value of uh, each type of grain, how they were handled, how far they traveled, and out of the analogy uh, with the grains, uncertainty can be a shorthand to signal the limits of knowledge. So there are different types uh, of uncertainty, and what I would like to do is to introduce some of the theory of uncertainty and give an overview of some of the, method that, the methods that can be used to analyze these different types of uncertainty. So first with, with the types, a couple, few definitions. Um, Knight first introduced a distinction between risk and uncertainty in economics in the 1920s. And he defined uh, risk as a situation in which the possible outcomes are known and the probabilities associated with each outcome can be calculated. So an example of risk is the casino game of roulette in which all the possible outcomes and their associated probabilities are known. Strict uncertainty is defined as a situation in which the possible outcomes are known, but the associated probabilities cannot be calculated. So an example of strict uncertainty is a hurricane. There are areas that are known to be prone to hurricanes, like the Gulf of Mexico, but this knowledge cannot be used to predict when the next hurricane will happen. So the novelty introduced by Knight is that not all type of uncertainties can be quantified. Risk is quantifiable through probabilities and statistics, but strict uncertainty is less amenable to quantification. As they, in the example of hurricanes, quantitative information about, for example, the historical uh, occurrence of hurricanes that does not reduce the uncertainty about the future, about when the next hurricane may, may happen. Wine introduced other two types of uncertainty, which are ignorance and indeterminacy. So first, ignorance is a situation in which the possible outcomes are unknown. And so we can say that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, an example of ignorance, which came up earlier today, can be the existence of black swans before the so-called discovery of Australia. Black swans were not considered as a possible outcome. And indeterminacy, uh, or systemic uncertainty, is a situation in which causal chains or networks are open. So indeterminacy is opposed to determinacy. It refers to the complexity of what is studied, uh, to the existence of non-linear causal relations, and to the fact that knowledge cannot be used to make predictions about complex systems. Indeterminacy is associated with systemic changes, um, which means that what we study, not only there, there may be ignorance about it, but also it may be changing. So the example that I use is uh, that of computers, which were supposed to make us work faster, but they have completely changed the way that we work. So these different types of uncertainty speak not only of the limits of existing knowledge, but also of the limits of what can be known. And finally, uh, Sterling introduces ambiguity as another type of uncertainty. Ambiguity is defined as a situation in which the outcomes are unknown, but not due to lack of knowledge, but to the fact that one cannot predict which of the known outcomes will be realized. So probabilities may be known, but because of multiple and divergent or contested evidence, one cannot know what will happen. So bisphenol A is an example. This is one of the most studied chemicals, Yet, uh, this does not reduce the controversy. Ambiguity alerts to the fact that more research may increase uncertainty rather than reduce it. New evidence may contradict previously existing knowledge, changing the knowledge gaps into controversies and not into certainty. So qualitative methods are necessary for two reasons. Uh, one is that some types of uncertainty cannot be meaningfully quantified or cannot be quantified at all. 
Quantification does not help, as we saw before, predict hurricanes, and it does not help solve the controversy over bisphenol A. And in the case of unknown unknowns, quantification is not possible at all. And the second reason is that a more qualitative assessment may help identify some of the knowledge that is lost or not considered in the problem definition. So there are many uh, qualitative methods of uncertainty analysis, which I have divided into uh, types of approaches, let's say, those that categorize uncertainty into typologies, and those that deal with the non-quantifiable aspects of uncertainty. Uh, I will give an example uh, of one method of each of the, these two approaches uh, for you to, to get an idea of how this could be applied. So the first example is um, a NUSAP. The NUSAP system uh, was introduced by Funtovich and Ravitz and developed by van der Schlaus, uh, who are colleagues of mine at the University of Bergen. Uh, NUSAP is aimed at the characterization of the uncertainty that is not explicitly communicated by the numbers. The NUSAP system combines quantitative and qualitative assessments of the uncertainty present in the scientific information. So uh, NUSAP stands uh, for five criteria according to which uh, information is uh, analyzed. One is numeral, which indicates the quantity or what is measured. Uh, the other one is unit, which is the type of measure, if it's kilograms or kilometers per hour. Spread is the statistical error. Assessment is the, refers to the quality of the information. And pedigree refers to the quality of the process through which the information is produced. The NUSAP system has been widely applied to a variety of case studies, such as the uncertainty surrounding climate change predictions, uh, groundwater modeling, and the monitoring of emissions and environmental assessment. The Netherlands uh, Environmental Assessment Agency has adopted NUSAP as part of its guidelines on uncertainty assessment and communication, and it's also one of the methods of uh, EFSA's uh, guidance on uncertainty analysis. The various categories make it possible to assess the quality of the estimates used and the possible trade-offs, for example, uh, between assessment and spread. So increasing the sample size can help reduce the spread but decrease the significance of the study. The pedig pedigree category gives an additional measure of the confidence of the experts involved about the data and the measurement schemes adopted. The pedigree yields a series of scores given by different experts, um, uh, and, they, and it can evaluate different things. So for example, pedigree evaluates the quality of the methods used, the quality of the data, uh, the acceptance uh, of the approach in a scientific field. Um, the pedigree can also be used, for example, to ask experts to assess the quality of the theories that are used. Experts ex assess the assumptions behind the numbers uh, that are analyzed, and the measure of uncertainty is given by the degree to which the experts' uh, scores diverge rather than by the actual scores themselves. So this makes the vagueness and ambiguity associated with numbers explicit and easy to communicate to policymakers. By relying on expert elicitation, NUSAP captures the tacit knowledge of experts, the craft skills, uh, that type of knowledge that used to come with the skills required to fill the bushel with different types of grains, the, the knowledge of the practitioner and not just that obtained at a distance with the number. Uh, this type of analysis is being applied, uh, for example, by my colleague Daphne Lemus uh, to the bisphenol A case, uh, which, as I'm sure you know better than me, it's a highly controversial case in which more studies often lead to more controversy and more precision does not mean less uncertainty. Uh, BPA has become a textbook example of cases in which scientific studies will produce different results based on the same data. So this calls for an analysis of uncertainty within and beyond the data. The pedigree analysis can help identify the uncertainties related to different theoretical assumptions, to different models, or combinations of models. So in addition, um, I argue that it is useful to distinguish between the different types of uncertainty. And this brings me to my second example uh, related to typology analysis. 
So one example of this type of approach is to distinguish between technical uncertainty, methodological uncertainty, and epistemic uncertainty, or epistemological. Uh, I will refer to a case study to explain how this approach can be applied. The case study refers to Ankanini, which is a slum uh, in the city of Stellenbosch in South Africa. And Kanini is, is an informal settlement that was built on occupied land and without authorization from the municipality. And for this reason, it lacks basic services such as electricity and uh, waste collection. Because of the lack of electricity, um, residents use paraffin for lighting, for cooking, for heating, and this has terrible consequences when it's burned indoors, uh, health consequences. So one of the requests that emerged from the residents of Encanini was to be connected to ESCOM, which is the national utility company, electric utility. Uh, in response to this demand, a local NGO set up a project uh, that provides small uh, rooftop solar panels. And uh, the, the solar panels were um, provided for free, and uh, the project started in 2012, and by 2015 they had uh, provided more or less 60% six, uh, of the households with solar panels. But although the solar panels apparently responded to the request uh, for electricity, the project caused an important conflict in the settlement, and the residents vandalized the infrastructure, leading the project to a halt. So what happened? I argue that the problem resides in the type of knowledge that was not considered, that is, in the poor management of uncertainty. The project solved the technical uncertainty associated with the practical issue of how to provide electricity. This was solved through a technological fix. However, the electricity provided uh, by the solar panels was not enough to meet the energy needs of the residents. Uh, electricity could only be used for lighting and did not substitute paraffin for cooking and for heating. Um, now, the demand for electricity and for energy in general could not be easily estimated because of methodological uncertainty. Um, the population doubled in four years in the duration of the project. Uh, changes in demand were due not only to the population growth, but also to changes in household composition. So, for example, for fuels that are used for lighting, the consumption doesn't change if there are more people living in the same house. But for fuels that are used for cooking, then the demand goes up with the increase of population. So different fuels, they have different demand patterns. <coughs> On top of this, uh, the different consumption patterns of the different fuels interact with each other. Um, so introducing electricity changed the energy mix as a whole. So all of this makes it very difficult to uh, make predictions to understand how to model how the demand will change and creates a type of uncertainty in, uh, of methodological uncertainty. But finally, and uh, most importantly, the project only took into account technical knowledge and ignored the local knowledge of Encanini's residents. So the request to be connected to ESCOM was seen by Ancanini's residents as a means to obtain the official recognition of the settlement and the provision of public services in general. Uh, so for this reason, they saw the solar panels as a threat to their request. And this is what created a, a conflict. They thought they wouldn't be recognized anymore because now they had the electricity. This is an instance of epistemic uncertainty. By giving privilege to technical knowledge, the problem was misinterpreted and the solution was misguided. Uncertainty in this case arises from the framing of the problem as a technical issue and from ignoring the social and political dimensions of the problem. Now I'll bring this back to an example that hopefully is more familiar to this audience. Um, and uh, use the bisphenol A case again. And this is also a case in which different types of examples, uh, uncertainties, sorry, are present. So the technical uncertainty is found, for example, in the way in which the practical problem in, is translated into a technical problem. So how to assess the safety of bisphenol A? Uh, choosing to carry out a risk assessment does not eliminate the uncertainty it poses different questions. For example, how can risk be assessed? 
Uh, one way can be to establish a tolerable daily intake, which is also not without its uncertainty. Uh, should we look at one chemical at a time or a cocktail effects? Should we look only at food exposure or all kinds of exposure? Methodological uncertainty refers to how the assessment is done, and so also in this case there are many questions. Should we use standardized studies or independent studies? Standardized studies have statistical power, but are not sensitive to non-standard effects. Uh, they take a long time to develop, they are not easily updated, and they may not respond quickly enough to regulation needs and to new threats. Independent studies, on the other hand, raise questions of reproducibility and do not have the same statistical power. If one uses more than one approach, then how should the results be combined? Should, how should the evidence be weighted? What time frame should be used to capture long-term effects? And finally, there is epistemic uncertainty linked to the different types of knowledge involved. So in this case, it can be toxicology, and endocrinology, for example. Which type of knowledge should be taken into account? Uh, since BPA raises concerns both, both for health and for agriculture. Epistemic uncertainty is, rela is related to what is at stake in the bisphenol A risk assessment. Is it the health of future generations? What are the ethical implications of this type of assessment? The ban of, B of bisphenol A in some countries has led the industry to use other types of bisphenol, like BPB, BPF, uh, which are also endocrine disruptors, but are not regulated yet. So the challenge is bigger than just establishing a tolerable daily intake of one chemical. And these questions make the assessment really difficult, which is probably why so many studies have not managed to decrease the controversy. So to conclude, I have argued that quantification is, is uh, inevitably linked to uncertainty and that, this, and that it is important to pay attention to the limits of knowledge and the types of knowledge that are lost through quantification. I want to stress that there is a difference between speaking of limits of knowledge and doubting the validity of knowledge. So the fact that scientific evidence does not give all the answers does not mean that it is not valid and that one might just as well base their decisions on reading the remains of coffee in the bottom of the cup. What it means is that scientific evidence should be complemented with additional types of knowledge, such as lay knowledge, local knowledge, the practical knowledge uh, acquired through the skills of craftsmanship. What this means for uncertainty analysis is that the choice of method of analysis is not simply a technical choice, but depends on what is at stake. So there is no blueprint, I think, uh, for uncertainty analysis. Um, a simple way of putting it is that qualitative analysis is not a second best option when quantification is not possible, but it is rather a complementary type of assessment that should be done on top of the quantification, especially when producing evidence that is policy relevant and politically sensitive. Um, a less simple way, maybe, is to say that uncertainty analysis requires critical reflection about the limits of knowledge and that analyzing uncertainty does not tame the uncertainty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zora, for your interesting uh, speech. We have time uh, for uh, some questions. I'm sure that uh, there will be many because <laughs> the topic is very hot. Do we have any question? Yes, please. Please use the microphone and keep the button pushed. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, short question on your definitions at the beginning. Um, if I see this, yeah follow this strictly as you mentioned it, do we then ever do in our area risk assessment or do we do strict uncertainty assessments, interdependence or whatever, ambiguity assessments? 
I, I think we do a bit of uh, all of them, and I think it's, so the interesting thing to, of using these different definitions is to see that there are different challenges in, involved, depending on the type of uncertainty that one is dealing with. Um, so you don't, of course, you're not obliged to use these labels or these definitions, but there are differences between dealing with something that is risk and something that is indeterminacy, and, and the, uh, not only the differences, but also the difficulties are, uh, are not the same. Other questions? Please. Ah, sorry, there, Alberto. <laughs> okay, I have a question here. Yeah. Oh, it's me? Okay. All three Thanks. at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Alberto Mantovani from Italian National Health Institute. No. This me. Okay. Yes. I, okay. I, I stand up. Okay. Thank you. Um, concerning the, um, I don't know if it's, I, I just would like to have your opinion. Concerning the issue of uh, bisphenol A, I, I, I thank you for, for making this example. One possible source of uncertainty, inverted commas, that's my experience, that's my personal experience, are the inherent uh, values of the assessors and of the scientists as human beings. I mean, uh, assessor A may look at the same set of data with a more uh, precautionary inherent value uh, compared to assessor B. How to, uh, that, that's my personal experience, I mean, in, uh, in, uh, you, also in European scientific committees. How to, how to cope with this? I'm, I'm uncertain how to. I also am uncertain. <laughs> uh, no, thank you for your question. I, so I was talking about um, technical, methodological, epistemic uncertainty, but I don't mean to say that this exhausts all the types of uncertainty that are involved in the bisphenol A case. It's just examples. Um, so, and the one that you, you mentioned the inherent values of the assessor. Um, so for example, the pedigree analysis, uh, when this is done uh, in a focus group setting, and one has the chance later to ask the different experts why they evaluated things differently. Uh, this is uh, a setting where these uh, different values may come up and may be talked about, uh, but that's a way of identifying them. I, I wouldn't know how to deal with them. Mm. Ulrike, we have a question. Okay, uh, um, I have a question regarding the new subsystem. So um, when I look at it, I wonder which of these uh, five uh, categories are evaluating how uncertainty has been treated in the assessment. So for example, if you take the numer uh, numeral and the unit and the spread, for example, it says it said in brackets the statistical spread. And, and we, we have gone beyond that because we have also expressed uh, like epistemic uncertainty in assessment. So I feel that... Is there like a version two of NewSup which sort of acknowledges the quantification of uncertainty in assessments, uh, which I don't see as exposed there right now? Yes, correct. Um, I should look for more recent examples of applications. I was showing um, examples that, yes, are, are maybe from uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but of course, the methodology is evolving, and it's, uh, every time that is applied to a new case, uh, for example, the different categories in the pedigree, um, assessment change, and I would think this is uh, thinking out loud here that uh, uncertainty analysis could be a category there. So, has it been considered how, uh, with uh, structured methods or not, was there agreement, disagreement about the uncertainty? So, it's a way to incorporate it. Fulvia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just coming back to uh, complex questions, so, so that you, the one you were highlighting, for instance, for BPA, um, in such kind of situation, uh, I think that in any case, what would be very important to try to characterize the uncertainty and try to be to have everything on the same page 
is first of all to try to define very well which is your, your, the question that you have to answer because if you don't have this clear from the beginning, people may have different view. And then coming back to, to what uh, Alberto Mantolani said before, I think in, in order to, to basically to make in a way that people expressing judgment about this issue are, can understand each other, it's, I think the only way is to try to have, to clearly, explicitly state which are the elements that we need to consider when expressing such judgment so that we can then express our uncertainty on the basis of some explicitly states uh, of things that we need to look for. So of course, uh, in a situation like this, when you have a, what you were mentioning, methodological uncertainty is very high, I don't think that we need to simply to give up, but I think there are methods to integrate all this kind of information. This is a challenge, but I think it's feasible. What, what is your opinion? Uh, yes, I also don't argue that it's uh, impossible. I'm just pointing out at the, at the difficulty. Uh, so like you say, and I agree completely, the definition of the question or the definition of the problem is very, very delicate. It's uh, often the first step in an assessment, and it can be very, very controversial. And it is in this case, because for example, there isn't agreement on uh, whether BPA is an endocrine disruptor or it just affects the endocrine system. So fr from the very beginning, uh, definitions are difficult, and a lot is at stake in these definitions. And so I think that these steps, they should be taken seriously. And uh, I agree with you when that uh, by defining things, you create a common ground, and then it's easier uh, for different uh, experts, for example, to talk about the same thing. But that also means that I'm focusing on one thing and maybe ignoring other things, which is the idea of the different types of knowledge. Uh, so it's necessary, but it has a cost. Uh, and this is part of the difficulty. Uh, I, I agree it can be done. It's just very difficult, not only from a technical point of view, but also because of what is left out when created, uh, creating this common ground.